All right, welcome to the Black Media Matters studio. Man, our show, Off the Clock. We haven't done an Off the Clock in quite a few years, to be honest with you, so it feels good to be back here in the Black Media Matters studio. Uh, call it Off the Clock because back at the time, we had a, a, a hard news show, the morning update show, and we were like, ah, we need a show where we're just kind of chilling and more conversational. And so we're here, Off the Clock, and today we have the GOP, they say the Republican GOP endorsed candidate for the governor of Washington State, Simi Bird. Yeah. Simi, welcome to the Black Media Matter studio. Thank you, Omar. It's an honor to be with you, brother. It's good to be here. All right, good stuff. Now, I got a lot, I got a lot of paper. I got a lot of, a lot of <laughs> stuff here to, here to talk to you about. But, but first and foremost, um, I, will, I will say this, actually. First and foremost, you came on our radar. Mm -hmm. um, last i'd say probably last july or august in the moja fest yes. parade yes. what used to be called the black community festival parade um it's now it's the moja fest parade mm -hmm. we've been going for over 70 years by yeah. the way representing yeah. our community we saw you in that parade mm -hmm. right and at the time it was like oh okay well here's this black dude <laughs> says republican <laughs> we'll see you know <laughs> But, I mean, that's what really jogged my memory uh, even a few a weeks ago is that, you know, you were actually in the Central District mm -hmm. last summer. Mm -hmm. And so then we'll talk about more everything went down in Spokane. Yes. When you got 72% 70, of mm -hmm. the delegates, you're now the GOP endorsed candidate. Before we get into all of that, though, why don't you take a few minutes, not a long time, mm -hmm. but a few minutes, man, and tell people, man, who is Simi Bird? Oh, wow. Um you know, just the, the kid born in the you know, Bay Area, uh, East Oakland, California. Mom moves us up here to Seattle, Washington when I was six years old. This uh, young man, uh, my sister, single mom, seven children, raised in Seattle. I didn't leave Seattle until I dropped out of high school uh, and then joined the Marine Corps because I dropped out of high school. And I thought that was the best way to go. And I did received my honorable discharge and got my high school diploma through the Corps and later went on to college, got my bachelor's degree in business administration, summa cum laude 4.0. So never give up on a child's education, graduate degree, Villanova University. I'm, I'm going to finish my PhD. Um, went back into the military army this time, uh, special forces, became a Green Beret when I was 43, um, became a, a federal employee worked my way up in the federal government to a GS-14 out of 15. So I, you know, I may have started off without civil rights, but that dream was always out there for me and I kept working and I've, I've, I've lived the American dream and I wanna share it with everyone. So a lot to say, um, but I wanna keep it short because I wanna hear from you, brother. Yeah, well, so why are you running for governor? Oh gosh, well, just what I was saying, that everyone has a dream and, and Dr. King had a dream and it's not done. I mean, you know, I came up, we started off on social services and welfare, food stamps. Mom was a great role model for me, but I saw her work and give up everything for her children. And there are people out there who I believe um, feel forgotten. They feel that people don't represent them like they should in government. And I see what's happening with our state, the state I was raised in, the state that is so beautiful, downtown homelessness lawlessness our education system i mean we have a disparity in, in reading uh amongst marginalized communities that's unnecessary in the 21st century so you get to a point where we have to stand up and say no more and you're right i was out in emotion fest i was in juneteenth um i don't forget where i come from but i have a goal of bringing unity to our state i have a goal of bringing back that those promises of the Declaration of Independence, that Constitution. And if not us, then who? If not now, then when? That's how it rolls. Right. Now, <clears throat> when you talk about unity, it's a good goal to achieve. Mm -hmm. But first and foremost, it seems like, at least from an outsider, mm -hmm. it seems like they need to find some unity in your party. Absolutely. So maybe you might want to tell people, you could tell our viewers here who might not have been following along, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying, like where going into this process, the, the delegate process. We don't, I don't want to spend too much time mm -hmm. on Spokane because it's a done deal. You're, you're the endorsed candidate, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? So we won't spend a lot of time there, but maybe you can set up to our, um, to our viewers 
the, the I mean, it's a fracture in your party. At least yeah. that's what we're seeing and what where we're seeing in media that there's a fracture is within the Republican Party. Mm -hmm. And when you talk about unifying the state, it seems like your first goal might be trying to figure out how to unify your party. So what I would say is this. There's a fracture in both parties. Mm. Um, in the Republican Party, and, and you're right, last week when we did win the supermajority, 72%, um, the delegates said, we want something different. We want someone who represents us. And they tried. And when I say they, there was a group of individuals, um, um, very well-funded, uh, what we would call the establishment or that political elite, the, the donor class. And they tried to disqualify me. And they represent more of that separation from the everyday people. And uh, it didn't work because the delegate said, no, that's wrong. We're going to stand for what's right. And that signals a change. And it's not just in the Republican Party, because just the other day in the Seattle Times, yet Democrat Senator Mark Mullet say that there was a buy-in of a million dollars. And so the point I want to make is we have to get back to the roots of serving the people and, and not this elite class, whether you're a Democrat or a Republican. Elected officials are there to serve the citizens of the state. And the citizens of the state should expect more of their elected officials. So in Spokane, I think we saw real people getting real about what's right. So <clears throat> two things then. I think that you probably need to share with our audience why um, you were, there was an attempt to disqualify yes. you. Yes. And but then also, do you feel that, that there's a, a disconnect or out of touch in, in the Republican Party as a whole if that many delegates, I mean, is, is, are they listening on the grassroots level? One thing that I heard <clears throat> when you talked with John Carlson mm -hmm. was that um, your supporters are activated on the precinct level, the PCO yeah. level, all the yeah. way up. And, yeah. and maybe did, you caught the party by surprise. So yeah. two things. One, why yeah. did they want to dis disqualify you? And two, you know, is there a grassroots movement underway that maybe people aren't seeing at eye mm -hmm. level? Oh, no, 100%. We'll go to the first. The party had a vetting process where we had a background investigation, you know, the general questions. Um, and in that vetting process, they had their background criteria and I passed their background criteria. But there was an article that came out in the Seattle Times that said, 31 years ago, Simi Bird had a misdemeanor. And then those individuals who were, I would say, not happy with my candidacy from the very beginning, I got in their way. They made multiple attempts to try to get me to step aside, run for lieutenant governor, be part of that slate in support of the other Republican gentlemen. And when I said no, they had threatened to, well, come after me and try to ruin my reputation. And then they start digging and bringing up all kinds of things. So they said, well, he had a misdemeanor 31 years ago. There we go, we got you. And then people said a misdemeanor 31 years ago is outside of the criteria, but no, no, we want this candidate, and you're absolutely right. The grassroots, they're, they are the representatives of the everyday neighborhood citizens, and they voted them in as delegates to go to Spokane to cast a vote representing them. The largest delegate convention in the history of Washington State. So this is, isn't by accident. They made a choice, and the choice was 72% for this candidate. Right. <clears throat> so it's pretty interesting what you said in that I know a lot of people from my neighborhood mm -hmm. who have um, who have a criminal record one way or another. Mm -hmm. And man, they're blocked from access. Mm -hmm. They can't. You know what I'm saying? Mostly in, in, the, in the job world or the job sense and everything else. So that's why I said I'm not going to belabor too much on that point, because like I know everyday people who who might have made a mistake years ago. But that, you know, that mistake still, you know, it's still on the record. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I mean, at least you, you can still run for your job. You're trying to run for governor. So your record's not stopping you yeah. for at least running. But a lot of people in my neighborhood, mm -hmm. their record has stopped them. You see what we I'm saying? We need to change that. And, and that's one of the things I, I, I represent. And I'm, so, I'm sorry to jump in, but oh, I have, this is my heart speaking. What I'm representing and that when they brought that forward and people say, well, no, we're, we're, we're going to use this to shut him down. It didn't work out that way because there's so many people out there that I represent, just as you said, people coming out of the system, coming out of prison, 
They deserve another chance. If they want to make their life better, everyone has the right to better their life. And that is wrong for anybody to say, I'm going to shut you down when you're trying to make yourself better for you, for your family. This is America. It's about time we get back to our roots and start talking about lifting people up and not holding people back. That's what Governor Byrd's going to be bringing, understanding that there's a lot of people. And it's interesting how you go through a time of mass incarceration where you have certain groups of people who will have those backgrounds. And what are we saying now? That those are the people that we're going to isolate from ever being able to advance? No, we're changing that. Wow. Um, a few, one more, two questions mm -hmm. about Spokane and the road mm -hmm. to Spokane, and then we'll, we'll move on. So just, just to be clear mm -hmm. for myself and for my viewers, yes. is that the Republican Party held their convention. Yes. Like most conventions, the convention is made up of delegates that are elected on the very local level, yes. um, someplace neighborhood precinct level. Mm -hmm. Those delegates then all reported into Spokane and then they voted for the candidate that they wanted. And you won 72% of the votes that were cast. That's right. So if this process is exactly like you say the process is, why is it that there's so much talk that you're not a viable candidate if 72% of the people who represent the actual streets, mm -hmm. the Republican streets, mm -hmm. uh, elected you to represent them? That's a good point. And that's what it comes down to. Smoke and mirrors, and as the smoke clears, you start to see what's behind it. And you broke it down so common sense. The people chose these delegates. The delegates went to Spokane. They cast their vote on behalf of the citizens that they served, and it was very clear. But for the other candidate who did not show up to the convention, the other candidate didn't show up, and then they turned and said, well, the delegates, they're now, they're not viable. The candidate's not viable. The delegates, they broke the rules and they're so, turning it on them when they didn't even show up to contend. This is interesting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, yeah. So do you, do you feel then that a, the, a Republican establishment mm -hmm. is like, is, is kind of separating itself from the actual GOP? A hundred percent. That is my opinion. That's my belief. You have a donor class or a political oligarchy, if you will where you have a very wealthy group of individuals who often fund candidates and they fund establishments. And they're the ones who make the decisions. Well, this is a country of the people, by the people, for the people. And those candidates should reflect that. But also, and always, it seems, those candidates are chosen by that same group. And when they don't get their way, you got to see what happens. That same group, their candidate didn't get his way. And then all of a sudden, the people who they're supposed to serve became on the opposite side. And then you must challenge the people because their vote didn't align with. Yeah. yeah. So I'm guessing the, the delegates themselves, they were not happy about the current status of no. things. Huh? No. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, this is, like I said, it's, it's, <laughs> I, w I was following uh, along. I think it was uh, Jim Bruner mm -hmm. from, from the Seattle Times was over there. So I was just following along like on, on Twitter and I was reading these updates and I'm like, man, yes. this is it's a lot going on. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. um, all right. So <clears throat> you're in. And what's the difference? Maybe you could explain what's the difference between nominee and endorsed candidate. For us, it's, it, we use the term endorsement. It's much the same. The same. Yeah. By the, oh, OK, yeah. I didn't know if there was another step. But no, no, you're not. OK, no, this, so, this is it. So for our viewers, when we say endorsed candidate, they could almost qu quantify that as nominee. hundred percent. Okay. So, yeah. all right. Good stuff. Um, <clears throat> now coming, coming out of, of this convention, mm -hmm. right. And before we get, like I said, I got a long list of stuff here. <laughs> Cause you know, I think it's important this opportunity. I mean, I got lots of issues in my neighborhood. Mm -hmm. I want to talk to you about mm -hmm. there's issues of Eastern Washington and everything else. But I think that if people also aren't clear that like you're, it's, I want to be able to clear the confusion because yes. it was very, it was confusing for me, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I quasi follow this. I'm following it more now and it's very confusing mm -hmm. for everybody that I talk to, you know, they're like, well, what, what, what do you mean? What's going on? Mm -hmm. Everything else. So 
you are the candidate for the Republican Party in the state of Washington. Yes, I am. We made history. There has never been a black American ever in the history of Washington state that has ever been endorsed <clears throat> or nominated by either party. So history was made last week, and that's something we can all be proud of. And I know I am. I'm proud of those delegates, and I'm proud of their communities. I'm also proud of the delegates who voted for the other gentleman, because his name was still on the ballot. They took their stand, they voiced their opinion about who they wanted, and the count was made. Mm -hmm. And that is, that is what freedom is. So what is your strategy then in, is do you, because the win here, we already know, and other people and other platforms can do the numbers much better than me. I'm not gonna delve into all these deep mm -hmm. numbers and everything else, but I, I will say that it's like, I think last, last election, Colt, excuse me, there was like a 13 or 15 percent gap, mm -hmm. or something like that, between him and uh, Inslee. Yeah, 500,000 votes. Right, and so I mean, it's a, one that's a lot of votes. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? No matter what, right? But like, what's your strategy if part of your established party has is now like saying like, hey man, we're not rocking with you, and then you you already have people who have been entrenched in the Democrat Party, mm -hmm. right? And not to say that people can't you know change their votes; they do all the time. Then you kind of got some independents that are out there. So mm -hmm. it seems like you, you got to make some different rounds or is there certain groups that are a higher priority to you? No, um, all groups are a priority to me. And that's the difference in the strategy. You saw it last year when I first came on the radar. I was there in my own community where I first started out in the Central District because all groups matter. All, all people, all citizens, people say, well, they're 7% of the vote. This person is 30. No, everybody well, has worth. That's, this is something I want to ask you. Mm -hmm. This was later on. But let me ask you about yeah. that. So, like, clearly, you're black. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yes. But when you do the math, mm -hmm. right? So one thing I do know is when you do the math with elections. So, like, for example, if you go back to, like, Obama, mm -hmm. right? If no black person ever voted for Obama, Obama would have still won the state of Washington. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, I mean, in the city of Seattle and maybe the state, if, if, you, if you removed every black voter from the last election... Inslee still would have won the election. Yeah. yeah. So, man, why do you care about the black vote? And why do you care about other, other communities here that make up smaller numbers when, you know, elections really come down to math? You know what? <clears throat> Th that is a million dollar question because if you cannot care about one person or you put a value or worth on a person because of what they have in their bank account or what their title is or what they look like, you're wrong and you're wrong for the state, and you have the wrong idea or opinion of humanity. And that's what we forgot. So no, I know where I come from. I, I know the journey. I know the struggles. And I think we need someone in that office who understands that we need to lift people up and we need to remember everyone. No, I, I get passionate about this. You can already see the emotion coming out. I'm glad you asked that question, but that's a question that, that, that speaks to my heart. This is what's missing in politics and in leadership of the state is recognizing the value that every single citizen has worth. And I'll say that over and over again. I don't care what the numbers say. I care about the people and I care about every citizen of the state. And if one person demonstrates that kind of humanity, other people will start to understand. That's what leadership is. We start loving everyone and other people will follow. That's the leadership. And then we continue to give into this establishment. These elitists who look down upon us, then, then when, when are we the people gonna actually start to close those, 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 uh, those, those gaps between wages or those gaps between, uh, I'll say this class system that exists that everybody tries to deny. Mm. No, the work starts when we the people start putting in our work and that's called self-governance. That's, the, that's why I got into this. That's why I'm running. And you want to talk about miracles. We made history again because people are waking up. And in Seattle, we're seeing it too. People are saying no more. We have to switch and we have to go into a different direction. That's why I have faith in the people. And the people are speaking louder and louder every day. Right. And a few more questions here. And then we're going to take a break. We'll talk okay. about your platform. And then I also want to talk to you about the party platform, mm -hmm. because you guys is talking about, at least in Danny Westneet's, uh <laughs> his opinion there, you talk about getting rid of mail-in voting and everything else. Mm -hmm. 
We'll get we'll get to that though. But I do I do want to say this is that when when you talk about people's voices being heard, mm -hmm. and we talk about um, the Republican Party and here in the state of Washington, and it, especially um, some of your delegates who are very vocal and passionate about your concern for you, mm -hmm. and you know I mean a, a lot of times it's portrayed as angry Trumpers. Yeah, you see what I'm saying. Yeah. And so I mean if that's the case, then that's the case. It's mm -hmm. like man, they're angry Trumpers mm -hmm. or is that just a broad, too broad of a brush of what's going on, especially in the rural parts of our state and how people are feeling? What is it that, that really has people um, wanting to seek this change that you're talking about in these rural parts of our state that, that us guys here in the, in the Emerald City might not see? Well, if I was to convey a message, I would say that people are people. And there's this smoke and mirrors um, misconception and, and also mislabeling, misidentifying. People are, are per, uh, perpetuating this message that there's this huge division, and there is division, but that this group is this and this group is this, angry Trumpers. People look at me and they see who I am. I tell them who I am. I, you can tell I don't hold back. I, I speak my heart, and I don't worry about the political consequences because truth is truth. And the message is simply this. It's not angry anything. People are ready for change. And they stood up and they said, this is the man who we want to represent us. And this is 39 counties being represented. People from 39 counties all around this state, from all of those precincts within those counties and millions of people represented in all those precincts. So that can't be denied. This is what they were talking about. This is what they were standing up for a change moving forward. I'm that change. So now when I've reached out to, uh, you know, like I said, we used to do the morning update show here. This was, what was that, oh yeah, 2020 to 22. Mm -hmm. So it was every day connected down in Olympia, City Hall, this and that. So I had to warm up some of those old connections. Uh -huh. So when calling down to Olympia, one of, the, one of the concerns was that the House Republicans right now have a very small minority mm -hmm. in, in, in Olympia. And some of the concern is, especially those that are in swing districts, that a bird campaign out in front will impact them. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. As in regards to reelection and just basically, you know, hand the state house totally over to the Democrats. Yeah. So that was one of the concerns that I heard that Republicans elected down in Olympia were voicing about your campaign. Yeah. Is that the campaign might ultimately be toxic for lawmakers in Olympia. Yeah, and so again, that's the problem with career politicians. They forget that they're supposed to be there for the people. And so they should be thinking about the people, what's best for the people, not what's best for them or their reelection. That's the problem. And so this is the change I'm bringing. I'm all about the people, which again, is why, why I go into the cities, why I go into the streets, why I represent all citizens of the state, east side, west side, both sides. We're about the people and the people are gonna respond in kind. So I'm not worried about the House Republicans, Senate Republicans, House Democrats, Senate Democrats. I'm worried about the people and I'm focused on the people. That's what the difference is. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. um, we're gonna take a quick break. And when we come back, we're gonna talk about some of your key platform issues. Excellent. All right. <laughs> You're watching Off the Clock. For us as parents, it's also very scary to think about um, the world that she's going into and what will she do in this world and who will she be and who will she be influenced by. And I think that this experience has allowed her to be confident in herself and to recognize who she is and what she stands for. When you run into a challenge, it is best to be like a buffalo. When they see a storm coming, they don't run from it. They go head first into it. Representing the Evergreen State, I am your Miss Teen Rodeo Washington, Jessa Thomas. Welcome to the Windswept Farm. Ho, 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 I need a little taste of home. 
All right, welcome back. Our conversation here with GOP endorsed candidate, Simi Bird. Yeah. All right, so let's talk about your platform. Then I also want to talk about the platform that the Republican Party okay. uh, passed over there in Spokane. So man, what are the, the key issues, agenda items for you going into this campaign? There's several. Um, we need to start with the education system. Um, we are averaging below 50% when it comes to English, language arts, mathematics, and science. And then we're graduating our kids at an 83% rate, and it's number one in our budget. We're spending billions of dollars. We're not getting the results. We're not focusing on academic excellence. And so there's work that needs to be done there. Um, I've written uh, during my PhD program on education um, performance, education outcomes, and I think we owe it to those parents and those children to make sure we focus on getting results. I think we need to focus on trades. I think we need to bring mentorship programs into schools, starting at middle school, so that children understand, well, you know what, there's an option there besides higher education. I can get a good job with a trade. And so there's a lot of work there. I think we need to also focus on, well, uh, improving the situation in terms of crime. We have one of the most dangerous states in the nation. I think number seven, um, auto theft. We're number three in the nation for auto theft. Mm. Rape is up 51%, property crime 73%, murders up 95%, and fentanyl, number one killer of all, all citizens age 18 to 45. Um, that's been out of control for a long time. So we need to deal with that, homelessness. We're spending billions of dollars on homelessness and we have brothers, sisters, nephews dying on the streets. My nephew died last year, fentanyl poisoning. At what point in time are we gonna bring real compassion and deal with this? And it's a matter of addiction and mental health, but yet we don't have the infrastructure to truly bring what's needed so, to help those people. Well then, all right, so these are good. So I think that you've outlined most issues that mm -hmm. almost any, any citizen in the state of Washington would mm -hmm. say. You know, it might be take one, give one, or whatever. Mm -hmm. But let's, let's take the last one there, okay. you know? I mean, and some of these are kind of tied together, but not. But let's take like this, the fentanyl crisis mm -hmm. and homelessness. I mean, what, what does a bird administration look like in addressing these in a comprehensive way? Now, you're yeah. supposed to run the whole state. Yeah, so here's one of the things we should start looking at. I mean, it's just one. We need to bring accountability. So those who are profiting in the deaths of our own citizens, they need to be held to a very high standard, class A felony. If you're dealing in mass quantities of fentanyl, class A felony, mandatory minimum. And I'm not talking about just single pills because we have people who are in the darkness of addiction and, and they themselves are, are selling just to get their next high. So we're not gonna, no, we're not talking about that because we're not doing that whole mass incarceration targeting certain groups. We're not doing that again. But what we're saying is those who are smuggling this mass and they're taking advantage off the deaths of our citizens, we're gonna hold them accountable. The next thing we need to start talking about is the addiction and the mental health. Homelessness, those people living on the streets right now who are dying on the streets, we need to clear 10 acres of state land. No, we're not gonna throw them on McNeil Island, forget about them, no. Clear 10 acres of, 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 of state land, bringing in our National Guard, our engineers, and let's build that infrastructure. We have high tech hospitals that we have within the National Guard. We have mental health treatment personnel. We have doctors. We have addiction treatment personnel in the National Guard. The governor, Article 3, Section 8, has that command and control of the National Guard. I will activate them, bring them in, create that infrastructure, and we will bring those services to our citizens who are dying in the streets, suffering the darkness of addiction. We will get them clean of addiction. We will bring certification programs, trade programs, so that they have a light at the end of the tunnel when they graduate from the program and they go to that transitional housing. On Monday, they have a good paying job that they can report to. And then we integrate them with their families that have been loving them and missing them for a long time. I felt that sting. And many other families feel that sting as well. Well, we would do anything to get our family members back. Well, let's actually do something and save taxpayers billions of dollars because it's not gonna cost that and we're gonna get the results. So it's almost, you didn't use these, these words, so I don't wanna put them in your mouth, but mm -hmm. it's almost like you were declaring a state of emergency around, around in, in that kind of approach when you're talking about 
you know, activating um, really the state resources in a very big and comprehensive way. It's an executive action, and the governor takes executive action in, in, in many ways. So I have the right of 43.06.10 subsection 11 of the RCW that, that gives me the authority to, the, to take that executive action. Mm. And when it comes to saving lives, why would we not do it? When everyone in the state, when I want to speak for everyone, I don't want to do that. But when we all want what's best, and that's what's best, that's true compassion. You know, that's that love, and that's what we're going to do. Mm -hmm. And now with, with homelessness, mm -hmm. um, and for one, I think that, you know, if you, if you live here in Seattle and a lot of places, but if you live here, people equate homelessness to the tents yeah. they can see. But I don't think that a lot of people realize that unhoused or housing insecure, mm -hmm. how big that number is. Like even in Seattle Public Schools, there's a ton of, of kids in the thousands that are housing insecure. Mm -hmm. for, for, for some of our viewers out there, you know that, that one friend who's always like, hey man, I'm gonna be around. You mind if I crash on your couch for mm -hmm. a week or two while I'm in the city? Mm -hmm. Most likely, they're housing insecure, but yeah. it, you haven't connected the dots. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. or, or, you know, it's, it's so many people on so many different yes. levels yes. that are insecure on housing. Government and people, want, we act when we see tents in the street. The tents are the final mile mm -hmm. um, in, in, this, in, in homelessness and being unhoused, but it's the most visible. Mm -hmm. I say all that to say this, is that in your approach to addressing homelessness and creating housing or housing opportunities in this state, is it just beyond the visible of what we see in a highway underpass or even right here in our front door? Mm -hmm. I would say this, when people actually go out and go out and talk to and engage with those folks, I, I want you to ask them, is this an addiction problem or issue? Is this a mental health issue? Or is this simply the fact that you don't have a, an apartment? And I think you're gonna find this is a majority of mental health and addiction. But to what you're speaking of, and I wanna to speak to that. You're speaking truth. There, there, are, there is housing insecurity, and this is a new phrase that was brought forward. So let's speak to the phrase. This is, we're talking social economic. Because what does that stem from? Jobs, which stems to trades, education, we have to go back and look at the root cause. That's what we need to do. It's not look at the tent necessarily. We need to look at what's getting people to that tent. And that's what people are failing to do. It's, well, yeah, that's what I was gonna say is that, you know, there's, there's like a lot of things, a lot of issues in our society, there's upstream yes. actions. And if you, you know, we're right here, just so people know, we're right here on First Avenue, mm -hmm. right in Pioneer Square, oh, yeah. and there's our studio here. And so, you know, we're part and parcel of, of you know, what, what's going on here in the city. But we also come across people in, in a few different ways of how they got here. Mm -hmm. One was um, uh, addiction by prescription mm -hmm. uh, yes. of how they got here. And then Another one is, and you talk to people where they had a job, mm -hmm. circumstances might be that they lost their mm -hmm. job, then they're out there on the street, and then actually, to actually be able to sleep through the night when it's, you know, 30, 40 degrees or something and raining, mm -hmm. that's where the drug addiction now right comes in, right there. And right so there. it's a misconception to think that somebody who's on fentanyl today mm -hmm. was started off on fentanyl. Right. They might they might have got their addiction by prescription. Yeah. They might have got there, and it's like, man, how do I remember back back yeah. during the days? It was like a stereotypical thing where they used to call the wino because he's sitting yeah. out there, and it was the bottle. But yeah. the bottle wasn't just for the bottle to stay warm mm -hmm. to be able to sleep on concrete yes. at night. Yes, you see what I'm saying? Oh, I do see. What and you're so saying. when. When we just take this broad brush, and I'm not saying you are, but when we take a broad brush and we just say, oh, this person's fentanyl, they're horrible, this person's whatever, yep. man, it's lots of stories that got people to where they're at. And if we don't acknowledge that, mm -hmm. then it's a disservice in even being able to help them. 100%. And, and, and we're saying the same thing. We really are, because that's why that phrase, the root cause. We're saying the same thing. We have to go back to the root causes. What led to them getting there? 100%, so the, I, I'm agreeing with you on that. 
What I'm also being real to say is they're there now. And I think we're also agreeing on that. They're there now, and the reason they're there now, not the cause of them being there now, but they're there now because now they're addicted, right? And, and that darkness and that grasp of addiction, which correlates directly to mental health. I'm a behavioral scientist, so I'm not speaking from a random, I just happen to, to fall in a book. No, I, well, I know. So then, I mean, you you mentioned what your your plan, yes. your comprehensive plan. Yes. But let's let's stay like even right here, yes. right now, right? And so you're running for governor, but mm -hmm. let's just say that you weren't yeah. at the at the moment. When when we hear people say, "Oh, well, here downtown Seattle, these, you guys just need to throw these guys in jail," no. and when there's there's no treatment. There's no whatever. And some of these drugs that people are on, you study these things, mm -hmm. the withdrawal kill you. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Depending upon what it is, if there's not proper services for Absolutely. them. But then also it's like, okay, well, let's just put these guys in a situation here where they're also not, not you know what I'm saying, not ready for in everything else. I want to know where, where, where do you sit? I know you told me like if elected, your, your plan would be, where do you sit right now though on someone who is here on the streets, they're clearly high on fentanyl. Mm -hmm. Should the police be arresting them and taking them to the to the King County Jail right there? Should there be, you know, some kind of services? Where is the gap that that you know to be able to get someone from the state of where they're in right now to at least a state of stability and on the right track? So I'll speak for my family, and then I'll let other families speak for themselves. But I've I've met with a lot of families who've lost loved ones to addiction, meaning our loved ones are dead um, from fentanyl poisoning. And many of us would say, I would rather have my nephew alive and in jail than dead on the streets, but that's me. Um, no, you just, you cannot just say, throw him in jail. That's wrong. You have to have a system and an infrastructure to support. It should be treatment first is what I'm saying. And you're right, I love what you're saying, everything you're saying. It's, it's a combination. Whether it's methadone, suboxone, we need to look at, it's not just one thing or another, it's a comprehensive approach, which is why on my plan, I did mention hospital, I did mention mental health, I did mention drug treatment, all together because it is a multi-tiered system of supports that are put in place, because it's not just one thing or another, it's several things combined to bring forth a comprehensive solution to a complex problem. So just incarcerating people is not the answer. We need to start working on our mental health and drug treatment infrastructure of Washington State. If tomorrow just everybody just woke up and said, I wanna get clean, we don't even have the system or infrastructure to facilitate that. That should be a concern to everyone. We don't have enough beds in our mental health facilities in Washington so State right you now. You bring up an interesting point. And this is, we haven't talked about, like, you know, a cross aisle and things like that. I mean, this is an interesting conversation thus <laughs> far. I haven't paid it too far down my list. That's okay. But when, when you talk about that, what would your willingness be? Because, see, what you just said right there is something that we hear from, I guess, just from people, from Democrats, from independents, from all kinds of things. What you just hit on is, is like, okay, how do, we, how do we make a plan? How do we just not lock somebody up and everything yeah. else? How do we make a plan? What would your willingness be, though, as governor to listen to the other side of the aisle? What would your willingness be to be out in these streets, listen to providers and listen to people mm -hmm. who are suffering? Because, you know, a lot of times, you know, people, I mean, especially if you get in the office, a lot of people come on the agenda and they feel elections have uh, consequences yeah. or whatever. So yeah. what's your willingness to work hand in hand to solve some of these issues? So this is one thing you hear from me often and from the very beginning of our conversation. What comes first? You already know the answer to that. People first. And so when it comes to a willingness, anything in support of the people. So it's, there is no across the aisle. It's when it comes to, to doing the right thing for the people, for the citizens of this state, there is no aisle to, cross, to go across. That's a, that's, a, that's a no brainer. It's an easy discussion. It's an easy decision. It's not even a decision at all. If they are ready to have a discussion to do what's, re what's best for our citizens, that, that's, a, that's a all day, every day, open door, let's get it done. And I don't care what your party is. I tell people that right now. I do a podcast every week because I make myself available and open to anyone 
to come on and, and ask me questions, difficult questions. Going out to the city and meeting and greeting and listening and learning, that's what I've been doing for almost two years, a year and a half, why? So that I can learn from those who I hope to serve. That's how it should be. So I will work with any, anyone, Omari, to, 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 to bring those solutions to bear. To, to, I want their support. I want us to work together on it. If they want it to be their plan, let it be their plan, but let's just get it done and save some lives. Right now, when we talk about education, mm -hmm. right? I, you know, my, my, my buddy AB, we're always talking about um, how come our kids, this is Seattle Public Schools, I don't know other school districts, man, some of these kids would benefit from like high-end tablets, mm -hmm. tools, you know what I'm saying? Like when I, when I talk to a lot of these young people, especially if they've just graduated as well, and they're out there, there's no career path and everything else, it's like, it almost seems like our state, because we're a bellwether state and so many other things, mm -hmm. how come that like with technology in the hands of our kids, we're not leading the country, mm -hmm. especially with all these technology providers here. You know, when these young people have tools in their hands, mm -hmm. and these days the tools might be, you know, like I said, it could be a tablet, it could mm -hmm. be something like that. I mean, how how is it, we, we all want to raise test scores, and man, I can tell you when, when, when it comes, one of the things we'll talk about here more later is that when it comes to the education gap, or mm -hmm. depending upon who you talk to, they might say the furthest from educational justice, mm -hmm. either way, mm -hmm. black folks is on the bottom, mm -hmm. right? And this is something that has been happening here for a long time. Yeah. So more than just like test for these test scores to improve, like you say you want them to improve, like I think all of us want mm -hmm. them to improve. Man, what different are you going to do about education in this state? And how hands on are you going to be? Because it's one thing to give good stump speeches and everything and get elected and go and do some photo ops and everything else. But what tools are you going to put in the hands of these young people and in these classrooms and be able to create educational opportunities and pathways for our young folk? Well, that's a comprehensive one. Yeah, um, I know. But, and if you, you might no, not have all of them now, but, you know, we got to be thinking like this. Oh, no, no. I know I'm with you. I, I, I've got it because this, this is my passion. So I know I've got the answers probably deeper than most people want to hear. Um, no, I have a plan for this. And, and it starts with... Um, again, bringing forth a education reform bill. I will show up with an education reform bill January of 2025 when I report for duty. And that's what's different between myself and any other candidate in history. I'm showing up with a handful of bills ready to present to the legislation. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna present it to the people first. So they that's see. what I was going to ask you. Oh. So what, you just, you're just going to sidestep the folks oh. and go there and pour your own mm -hmm. bill? In. Oh, no. No, I'm, I'm, I'm writing it because I have that right as governor to mm. present legislation to the legislature. But what I'm going to do differently is I want to send it to the people. And I want them to see what their governor is putting together. It's called transparency. So they can see that I want to ensure that every school district has a strategic plan that focuses on the child in the classroom and those teachers to give them the resources and the tools and ensure that we understand how each child learns differently. I'm gonna tell you, no matter what party it is, mm -hmm. there's always some people who tell the people who are elected or even in big companies, they're always telling the CEOs that this is what the people want. Yeah. And so I'm just telling you, because, you know, I mean, we deal with that all day long. Mm -hmm. We bump into people and they're like, well, so-and-so told us that this is what the blacks want. Yeah. And you're like, I ain't never seen this guy in my neighborhood. Uh -uh. Uh -uh. I would just say this. If you're putting together a comprehensive bill on education, man, I would really hope that you move past all the high-paid academics mm -hmm. and consultants and you actually talk to parents and you talk to these kids out there, yes. and you talk to after-school providers. Mm -hmm. These other people are important. I'm not trying to knock nobody out their job. They provide information and everything else. But what's missing in this state, mm -hmm. whether it's Republican, whether it's Democrat, mm -hmm. and even with Come these on. big businesses here, is, man, they're not on the streets. Mm -hmm. They're not sitting here talking to people in whether any issue that you want to talk about here. You know what I'm saying? You can talk about crime. 
And how many how many times are the victims, the actual victims and their 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 neighborhoods, their community members, how many times are they spoken to? And so there's a gap mm -hmm. between the streets mm -hmm. and leadership. And so I'm going to tell you, if you're going to go to Olympia with an education bill and I'm, I'm mm -hmm. going to call all around the mm -hmm. state, I'll be like, man, the semi come talk mm -hmm. to you. If they ain't talk to you, you know, we're going to have to get we have to have a oh, conversation. No, we, and we will, because that's exactly what I've been doing. And I'm going to keep doing it between now and January. And I actually had it on my Facebook page because we, we've done several sessions. I've met with parents, I've met with educators and, and administrators, and we're gonna keep it going because it's not just from one region or one side of the state, it's all sides of the state. Oh, I, I love exactly what you're saying. We need to spread that word just as you said it. You have to get to the grassroots of the well, issue and talk to those real stakeholders. I mean, it's, it's the same. Yeah. That, that we hear and it's real that sometimes the people closest to the problem is closer to the solutions. Mm -hmm. And we talk about that. I think that, we, you know, even around the issue of crime and, and violence, mm -hmm. like here in the city of Seattle, you know, as we walk through that door right here, the name Elijah L. Lewis is up there on the door, you know, rest in peace. That, that Devon Pickett, his wife, Kiana Rose, she, she wrote that, that heart that's on the wall. I got names that was written on this studio walls. They're no longer walking with us. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Our community, the Central District, have been talking about being impacted by crime yes. since I was in high school at James A. Garfield High School, a generation later when my son was in high school and everything else. But you know what's crazy? I'll be honest with you. Don't nobody ever listen to us black folks about crime. Crime mm -hmm. becomes an issue then when it's now in white neighborhoods, yes. when it's in more affluent that we've been waving our hands for 30 years, if not more, but nobody cared. And so now it's like, oh, now different neighborhoods, more affluent neighborhoods and everywhere else. It's like, man, crime is everywhere. Now people are like, oh my God, we got to do something about crime. And I'm like, man, you late for the party. Mm -hmm. Let me pour you a double. Yeah. We've been trying to sit here and have conversations about crime for the longest, but now also what's happening is, is that when people are crafting policies and everything else, they're not talking to the people most impacted. Yes. Mathematically, statistically, and everything else, a lot of things to address crime are being crafted by the people least impacted. And there's zero input from the people who are the most impacted by crime. Mm. And so, man, I'm just putting it out there. You know what I'm saying? That oh, it's like, saying. When, when you talk, this is something that's near and dear to me. You know what I'm saying? Last year, I went to five funerals in five days. You know, this is, it's, it's a lot of trauma in Converge. Yes. It's a lot of trauma in what we cover. Yes. You know what I'm saying? Yes. And so when I see government on any level ignore, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. The victims, the people most impacted. So, I mean, crime, we can do a two hour show, yeah. but I just want to throw this back to you because you know, I mean, there's lots of different things and we'll talk about police here for a second, mm -hmm. but I want to I want to hear from you as to what I've just said here. What is your approach in a comprehensive approach around addressing issues around yeah. crime with talking to the actual people yes. who are impacted? 100 percent. 100 percent. So when you saw me at Emoja Fest, when, when other folks saw me at Juneteenth, when other folks saw me at, at, at this church in the CD or that church in the CD or because I'm there. Because I'm going out and I'm talking to people. I don't know what I don't know until I know what I know. And, and how do you know? Because you listen to people. So this, you're right, I'm feeling you. I'm sitting here like, amen and yes. Because to me, it's common sense. You, if you don't know, you don't know. You can't be someplace else and act like you know something that's here when you've never been there or you've never lived there or you never talked to anybody there. You don't have to have lived there just at least go talk to someone who lives there and at least get their perspective. Learn from them. I am learning from people because I understand at the root level, the root cause, those who you wish to serve, you must hear from and understand first. This is what we the people are about. This is what I am all about. I, I, I'm telling you, you get... You're raising my heart rate all over the place from the very beginning of our conversation. I'm there with you. And I'm not saying it to say it. Everything I've said since I have been running for this office, you are saying right now, it's real. It's common sense to me. So let's do it, is what I say to everybody.
Right. And, you know, I'm not, this next thing I'm going to say here mm. is I'm not saying that the Republicans would have done any better job. Mm -hmm. But I will tell you is this, is that, um, and one of the things that I've heard you say is you want to make Washington great again. Mm -hmm. Sounds like a play on kind of like uh, on Trump, make America great again. But when you talk about, at least when I hear make Washington great again, and if you do get in the state house, the Washington that I want to see, make, Greater. make let, 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 me, let me tell you, I, I, I want to I wanna go back to when black home ownership wasn't in decline. Mm -hmm. And black, so the, the point I'm getting at right here is that what people might not realize when I heard your interview, um, it was a really good interview Thank with John Carlson. I, I picked up a lot of information. But I think that, that a lot of people might not realize that in there, somebody in this state, either Republicans, Democrats, somebody else better figure it out. There's a lot of discontent. Mm -hmm. And the discontent isn't just somebody who's sitting over there in Clee Ellum or Ellensburg or Thorpe or Ponderay County mm -hmm. or in Walla Walla. It's also right here in Seattle, mm -hmm. South Seattle and Tacoma and Pierce County mm -hmm. where you've got poor people, people, people who are sitting on the edge. People who are sitting here marginalized, irregardless yes. of color. Yes. And that also creates an opportunity. Yes. You see what I'm saying? And the, what, what I want to see and make it, if you want to make Washington great again, mm -hmm. because home ownership is yes. directly leading to, to generational wealth. Right and there. when we see a decline in home ownership, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? We, we see this gap in the gap between black uh, um, 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 home household income and white household income. That is 42,000 to yeah. 105,000. Yes. I don't want white folks yes. to make less. How can we, how can black folks make more yeah. when we talk about this education gap? So if it's make Washington great or greater or mm -hmm. great whenever, mm -hmm. I have great memories in this state oh, as yes. a kid. Yes. I, I have great memories of a neighborhood that was full of examples of black owned businesses mm -hmm. and black excellence everywhere in the central district. So, you know, it, that resonates with me, mm -hmm. but that's my vision. Uh -huh. If I was to be like, man, let's make mm -hmm. Washington great. Uh -huh. I'm curious what yours is. Oh, well, it's right there. And I have spoke, oh, I spoke to it. And I'll speak to it again. It's what you said and building upon. So I'm, I talked to a friend of mine. She's a pastor here. Uh, well, a pastor in the city. So I won't say here, but a pastor in the city. And we had this conversation uh, last week. And she said, Simi, we need to, we need to tweak that a little bit to greater. Uh, and I said, okay, let's do it. And we are going to do it because it's going back there and then making it even better than we people, our young people, they can't even, they can't afford to, uh, to buy a house. Home ownership is not there anymore. I'm not gonna, uh, anymore. Think about that. A young person, a young couple, how are they going to afford a home in Seattle? $635,000, Puget Sound, average home. How are they going to afford that? And so as governor of Washington state, we don't need more career politicians who have on their resume, I'm a, I'm a successful politician. We need someone who understands economics, micro and macro. We need someone who understands you go into communities, starting at the, the, the middle school level and bring mentorship in. We need to raise people up. And I've said this, the days of paying people enough money to keep them poor for the rest of their life, those, that, that, that ship has sailed. That dream must be reignited again because that march in Washington was for jobs and freedom and no one gets any more freedom than a good paying job. And that is the pathway to closing that gap. I think, to be honest with you, I think, you know, for, for this governor's race and for, for, for any of these statewide races, man, I think whoever figures out can communicate and actually act upon the fact that poor black folk in Seattle is, is, is have, have the majority same issues as poor white folk yes. over, over there, like I said, in, in Eastern Washington. And the thing is, is y'all politicians, politicians in general mm -hmm. thrive off of division. Yes. And what people don't realize is when you go over there, when you, when you go to certain parts of our state and inaccessibility it manifests itself in a different way, but it's still inaccessibility. A young kid here, they ain't got no money for their internet at house, even though there's fiber optics everywhere. Mm -hmm. They can't get no internet, so they sitting outside of a McDonald's parking lot trying to get Wi-Fi. But you know, I was over in White Salmon, 
and I was over in Quincy. Mm -hmm. When I was over in White Salmon, I met with a veterans group over there who they can't, they can't access the VFW website. Mm -hmm. I met with students over there who would love to do telelearning. They can't, they can't get online. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. The barrier to access mm -hmm. is, even though this is a rural part of the state, some of our people are impacted are the same over here mm -hmm. on this part of the state. A lot of the issues that are impacting people in our state are the same issues, but we keep allowing the political people here, these politicians, to drive the wedge. Yes. You see what I'm saying? And so, like, we're going to see who, who can ever, maybe nobody will figure it out. Yeah. But it isn't until, it isn't until people leave Seattle and you go over and really, really be in eastern Washington. Mm -hmm. It isn't until somebody from over in Franklin County mm -hmm. or over in Benton County or in Ponderay or all those places come over here and into the neighborhood and they be like, damn, they kind of dealing with it's a It's a different, but it's the same thing. It is. Oh, it is. It is. I, I Again, I'm a broken record. I, I've been saying it. And it's, I told probably every week, you, you, you have a, a black business and a white business over taxation, again, over regulation. Over regulation. No, but, but it's, this, but it's the same. Over taxation. But, but it is. So, so stop and think about it. If you own a business and you have employees, you have to pay quarterlies. So I've owned a business, I've had employees, and I had to pay quarterly employee taxes. L and I, all of these, these are regulations and these are taxes. The cost of doing business. The number one employee, employer of employees, most people in this state, 50.7% of all people who work in this state are employed by small business owners. Small business owners are getting crushed and big businesses are more likely to thrive at the cost of losing our small business owners. So we need to, when I say regulations, I, I know what I'm talking about. That is the difference. If you've never had to pay quarterlies, if you've never owned a small business or had employees, you don't know what you don't know. So at least try to learn it. I've lived it. And I get what you're saying. Thriving off a division and just putting talking points out there doesn't get it. Yeah. It, it affects us all. I'll be, I'll be honest with you, man. Uh, you know, like me personally, mm -hmm. I don't like no politicians. Yeah, it, you know, take it personal. I don't because but I'm you know not. What I'm saying? <laughs> like none, you know, but I feel that like this platform is important mm -hmm. because um, our viewers deserve to hear from yeah. everybody, yeah. you know, in a comfortable space. You know, we're not all about the sound bites or the yeah. click, quick yeah. whatevers or things like that. You know, we're having yeah. a good conversation, but I really feel that that. The, uh, the there is a political class mm -hmm. on both sides, if mm -hmm. you want to put it like that, Republicans yeah. and Democrats, that that benefit off of ignorance, of of the um, of constituents, yes. of how busy people are, yes. working two three jobs, and this is why that person is your enemy. Yeah. When usually them people got more in common. Poor people got more in common with everybody than yeah. anybody. Yeah. You yeah. know what you know. What, you know what 100%. I'm no, it's true, though. <laughs> it, it, it's true, though. And what's, what I found interesting and fascinating, remarkable, is a lot of us want the same thing. Yeah, of course. I mean, I, I have people, you know, because I, I live in uh, eastern Washington now, and I, people know Jason Rant said on his show, you're doing something Republicans never do. You're going into the inner city. And I'm like, I don't, why have they never done it? Where have they been? Why am I the only one? That's a shame. But, well, you know, I can't go back in time, so here I am doing the common sense thing to do for the common sense reason. But the people in Eastern Washington, when I go back and I tell them that, they're like, what do they say? It, that's what I'm hearing. It's amazing. You know, it's, it's interesting. We, we're going <laughs> to take that. You got more time for us? Oh, absolutely I do. Okay. We're going we're gonna to take a, a quick break right now. And uh, when, we, when we come back, I, I just got a few more points for you. But you know what I'm saying? While I got you here in the oh, studio, yeah. we want to hit everybody. I got you. We'll be right back. The importance to share the history of the Buffalo Soldiers of Seattle and Buffalo Soldiers of everywhere, including cowboys and cowgirls of color everywhere, is really important because most likely they're forgotten. It's important that they're acknowledged, especially for girls like me who look up to them. At a rodeo, it's, it's got an impact on people when they see somebody doing something like that, especially a person of color, you know what I mean? It's 
got a big impact on people, I think. Representing the Evergreen State, I am your Miss Team Rodeo Washington, Jessa Thomas. Welcome to the Windswept Farm. All right, welcome back to uh, Off the Clock. I'm your host, Omari Salisbury. You see right there, that's an uh, upcoming film that we have coming out. It's called Facing the Rain, and that's the story of our reigning um, Miss Teen Rodeo Washington State, yes. Jessa Thomas, and you know we we uh, we're filmmakers here as well as convert. That's one of our biggest things, to be honest with you, is making short films, documentaries, things like that. And so we had the camera crews out there with Jessa um, while she was at the rodeo in Elma, Washington. I think that's Grace Harbor County. And then out there at the Windswept Farms in, in Thorpe. And then also at her coronation in Clee Ellum and everything else. And so you see the coming soon right there. It's actually going to premiere on Fox 13 here in Seattle. So don't worry about it. I, I know that a lot of people watching this right here, they're like, oh, well, that's not my Fox. You can download the Fox local app for free and you'll see there Fox 13 Seattle, you know what I'm saying? And you can find out when we're going to release it. I encourage you go to our website, whereweconverge.com, sign up for our newsletter. We don't spam people. We're not politicians. <laughs> <laughs> we, don't, we don't spam people. We do, but we do for people, especially over there on the eastern sides of the mountain where you're, you're really trying to get a pulse of what's going on over here. We do a week in review. So every Friday, there's our top stories that come out from Converge. And like I say, you go to whereweconverge.com, sign up for our newsletter every Friday, and um, you'll see the alert of when this film is released. And probably about in the next one month, like I said, it'll release on Fox 13, Fox 13 Plus here in Seattle, and really nationwide in the Fox local app. So, voila. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's wide open spaces over yeah. there. You oh, know yeah. what I'm saying? We, we, we had it's a beautiful. lot of fun. It's beautiful. Washington is beautiful. Well, you know, Washington is beautiful. Mm -hmm. And um, that's one thing that's undeniable about our state. Um, when all the way from, from Nia Bay yes. to Walla Walla and, and in between, it's a, it's a real diverse state in topography, um, in geology. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course, in culture and people and all that good stuff. And now speaking of that, though. Yeah. yeah is that um, when we start, especially we talk about topography, we've got, we have some, some special challenges here that our beauty, as we say, is our, our beauty is what makes it difficult in a sense. Mm -hmm. One thing I want to talk about is infrastructure yeah. because it presents things. You see, even here in the city of Seattle, we kind of squeezed mm -hmm. in in this one freeway right here, right? Because we're in between the Puget Sound and between Lake Washington. Now, speaking of the Puget Sound, the Washington State Ferries. Yes. This is a very big discussion. Yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's a ferry. Washington State has the biggest ferry system in America mm -hmm. and one of the biggest in the world. Mm -hmm. and right now, ferry systems got under a lot of heat, man. You know, mm -hmm. you, you got some boats that are out of commission. Um, we have some boats that are supposed to be coming. They're a ways off. This is it's interrupting travel, business, commerce. Uh, what would your plan be in going in and addressing Washington State ferries? Again, the Washington State ferries, again, the biggest ferry system in America. Yeah, and, and folks need to know it used to be the best ferry system in America, and, and now it's um, down to being the worst. Um, we have about 15 out of 19 um, boats fully operational, and, and that's by the day. And so in terms of solutions, we have to start with the human resources aspect. We don't, we have an attrition rate right now. And that started with um, uh, the vaccine mandates. We lost a, a lot of folks and people forgot about that. Um, and we don't have enough people to, to, to meet the, the decline in personnel with retirements and, and such, training for, for, for deck staff and such. So we need to start there. And that's something from a professional aspect. Um, I have a graduate degree in human resource development. Um, I'm a PHR, so we're going to focus comprehensively on that. But we talk about the boats. Well, we have a choice between marine diesel and what Jay Inslee and, and his administration has proposed, which is electric, which is about two to three times more money than um, modern marine diesel. I lean on the marine diesel side. It's much cheaper for our taxpayers. It does not produce the same carbon emissions as the old uh, diesel boats do. And the turnaround and production, getting them operational on the waters, 
is so much quicker. And so why would we not start filling those gaps and bringing forth that solution of taking our ferry system back up to number one, the best in the nation again, when we have the resources to do without overtaxing our citizens for, for these, these, these almost triple the cost electric uh, vessels where we don't even have the electric infrastructure right now in Washington State to support a full EV. So we need to start looking deeper into this instead of these facade solutions that aren't long term. So you say you listen to people. So what, you, you've been out there? You know, and so by the way, for our viewers, we're, this is Marion Street right here. That's the Marion Street pedestrian bridge. We're mm -hmm. one block from, mm -hmm. from Coleman Dock right here. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, are you, are you going there to Mukilteo and to, to Coleman, to Ebbets, to Vashon, you know, oh, yeah. or, or generally, are you speaking, what is what you're oh, yeah. saying, what the people who actually rely upon our ferry system, is that what they want? Well, they, they, well, so what they're saying is they want their ferry system up and running and dependable. And because of the problems with our fleet that we have 15 out of 19 boats actually operational, we've cut back on our schedule significantly. We've cut lines because they're undependable. They're saying we want our boats operational. And we have this, this, this inaccurate perception of, a, of electric vessels versus marine diesel because of what's being put out to people. They're not getting the full story. And I think what I understand, well, I'll tell you what people are telling me just to answer you directly. They're saying, no, marine diesel is not gonna pollute like people are saying it is, and it can get us back and forth quicker sooner now let's do it. And they're dependable, let's do it. That's what I'm hearing. It's a minority of people say, well, no, we'll wait. We'll wait for the electric. We're, we're happy with everything, we'll wait. I'm not hearing that at all. Mm -hmm. Like to me personally, it seemed like, you know, I don't know, I need to go deeper into all the solutions, Yes. but it seems like the people who are using, I mean, even people, right, it's all of our tax dollars. So mm -hmm. people who don't use the ferry should also have a say in it. Mm -hmm. But I think that, like, the people who rely upon these things, you know what I'm saying? Yes. And so uh, I'm going to dig a little deeper because, yes. you know, the, the dock is only one block away. Yes. I, might, I might take that ride over to Bainbridge and do my own polling yes. and see, see what the Bainbridge riders yes. are, uh, are talking about. And, and ask, the, ask the employees, ask the, uh, the folks on the ship, the, the employees, what do you think? about what was being proposed and about modern marine diesel. And I mean, those, those mechanics, those folks who actually do, they know. Yeah, you know, I mean, I, so for me, this is why it's an important question for me, I love the ferry. And the reason why I, lo I love the ferry is that as a little kid, you know, my mom, she would take us all down because it, that, was, that was an affordable excursion yes. as a little kid and back then. We even had the streetcar out, you know, out there on the waterfront. Yeah. And so, from a, as a little kid, I remember getting on that boat and we yeah. go over there to Bremerton and go over to Bainbridge. You know, people appreciate and use the ferry system for different ways. So, yeah. so I got, I have an emotional attachment to Me our too. ferry system Me here, too. and so I do know that it it definitely needs a lot of love and repair. Yeah. You know yes. what I'm saying? Moving forward, 100%. Uh, keeping it on the issue of infrastructure mm -hmm. here. Like I said, last, last year, I had the pleasure, me, my colleague, uh, Francisco Lopez and uh, Jordan Summers, we moved around the state um, working on a project and it was about access and digital access mm -hmm. in, the, in the state of Washington. And when we were in White Salmon, like I said, we met with a veterans group there and these are veterans. It's a high population right there, by the way, you might know of veterans mm -hmm. along that Columbia River. I um, and you know, they, they, they have little to no internet, right? They, like I said, they can't connect to VFW, you can't do telehealth, everything else. Then you go and you talk to, you talk to business owners. You got people who can't put their house on Airbnb mm -hmm. because you know what I'm saying, there's, there's no bandwidth and things like that. You talk to people who wanna you know, take classes online, they can't take classes online. Then all the way down to our youngest learners mm -hmm. who are literally falling behind. And White Salmon is just one city out of several cities in that part of the state. And so the, the, the digital divide, mm -hmm. and it, it divides, it, it divide is there. It divides differently in the cities than what it looks like in rural, mm -hmm. but there's a divide in both. Mm -hmm. But we're focusing on, on Eastern Washington and rural parts of the state. 
And the, the internet providers are just like, hey, look, man, I mean, we're still in business. It's not economically viable for us to run fiber optic out yeah. here to this town or that town. Yeah. The end result of this digital device or in this state, whether it's in this big city or over in rural Washington state, is that our young learners will continue to fall behind. Businesses don't have opportunities. Our beloved elders aren't able to get their telehealth and everything else. What are you going to do as governor to address the digital divide and this big infrastructure issue that we have here in this state? And like we went back to how beautiful it is, the topography here presents one of those issues, but what are you gonna do? One, do you even find it as important? For me, it's passionate, but do you find this as an important issue? And two, if so, what are you gonna do about it? Yeah, so my, my first job when I first went in the surface was communications. So there, there, there's that. I have a resume in communications. I understand um, fiber optic uh, networking um, uh, systems. Uh, so I won't go into that, but uh, it's on the resume. Yeah, that's important infrastructure. And what I would say is when it comes to education, in terms of the percentage of young people and, and learning, um, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's important. It's a smaller percentage, but it's important. I would say city and rural, two different things. One is often affordability and access uh, in the city, but similar use the, the same definition in terms of access, but rural, it's more infrastructure development. Mm -hmm. And in terms of solutions, I think partnerships. So partnerships with counties. Um, we have grant programs out there right now that have been explored. Um, and that I talked to some folks down in um, Lewis County, and it was a successful partnership where the state partnered with uh, a county co-op to bring in fiber optic networks and it worked and it was affordable. And so now they want to duplicate it into another county. I think that is a good template that we can spread in rural locations. And it's just, again, not saying that the state has to take the lead on this, but partnering with private and county entities would be the way to do it. It's just simply slowly developing our infrastructure because I, I, again, it's, it's the way of the future and everything is access digitally nowadays. It, it's just, you have to stay up and it's so much more and you know that and, and i know that and so just being a, a governor that understand understands the importance of fiber optic uh communications um and and its broad reach and value i think that's where it begins but actually knowing how to bring it in and how to forge those co-ops and partnerships that's what we're going to do we're going to build upon those those templates and grow it all right so now i wanted to a few one more thing two things here about yeah. your party and then I wanted to bring it back to my neighborhood. Now, um, Danny Wesney, mm -hmm. I think you probably saw his uh, editorial, right? Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that, that got a, a lot of people's attention, especially my attention here, is that it said that in the Republican Party platform, that it's like y'all want to do get away with mail in voting, mm -hmm. something that we've done here for over 40 years, I believe, mm -hmm. we're a national leader when it comes to that. Why, bruh, why? So here's what I would say, election integrity is a concern for a lot of people, and, and it's not just amongst Republicans. It, 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 so this has been actually surveyed, um, and I like statistics. So people are concerned about voter integrity and and it's not has nothing to do with presidential elections um, specifically but are our systems reliable are they fair and we go back to the primary so what happened in king county and with the election systems in the primary that's nothing that i am fabricating it's something that the seattle times brought forward and many other news outlets because it happened there was a server swap out illegally that was done and then the camera system that oversaw the illegal swap out happened to be out it's those kinds of things that happens that concern citizens um chain of custody of ballots from the mail to the machines and from the machines being scanned and what i say is simply this let's make our election system bulletproof and the most reliable form of ensuring that every single vote is counted is to ensure that it's on a paper ballot where it's actually counted and processed that day. So that is what people voted for at that con uh, convention. And that's why they voted for mail-in so, ballots. But, so if, 
did they vote for that? Because I mean, so here's the thing: is right. It's I think that people want secure, safe, free election. Everybody yes. can agree upon that, yes. right? And so we're just talking about okay, what's the solution, yes. right? Everybody wants that. Nobody wants rigged elections. Yes. But man, is part of that coming though to because people in the Republican Party are feeling that man that their vote is getting rigged or their vote isn't being counted. Like if you guys were winning all the seats, if you was lapping everybody in the state like the Democrats are, would this be an issue for you? You might be like, yeah, we love mail-in voting. We win every election. Right. So th th there's the beauty in that question. The beauty in that question is simply this. It shouldn't matter which parties hold in the office because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, all people should be made whole based on regardless of, of what party they're in. If you have a system that's bulletproof, that means it doesn't matter who is, is, is running the gambit. It, it means that the, the will of the people is guaranteed and our system guarantees it. There is no possibility of impropriety because the system is bulletproof. And that's, that's what I support. Yeah, no, I mean, like, I hear you. I'm, you know what I'm saying? I'm glad that you're able to explain your point of view. You know, I mean, as somebody, who you know with with the, for me the the mail in the mail in ballot, um, and we cover we used to cover like we'd be down there in, in Renton you know all the time at the at the headquarters and everything else, and I'm not saying that there's not possibilities for issues everywhere. I don't work there. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not gonna put my name on the line to say that hey man everything's whatever. But at the same time, you know what I'm saying we. We're, we've grown to trust, yeah. you know, all I can speak for is King County elections because it's the county that I live in here. But, you know, my mama, my mama grew up, you know, in, in Jim Crow. Mm. My mama, my mama was 80 years old. And so my mama's going to supposed to sit out here now in, in this line. And she would, because that's the generation that she's from. Mm -hmm. And my mama would tell you, she said, even to this day, she said, I don't vote for me. She said, I vote for my mama, who was never allowed a chance to vote. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. That's what my mama would tell you right now. She'll sit out there with her cane, and she'll sit in a line for hours to go and cast her vote. But I just, for me, it's like, is that still necessary today? No. You see what I'm saying? No. And so for that, so I'm I'm going to write an election integrity bill again. Here I go again. And it's going to go out to the people first before it goes to the legislature. And so mail in voting will still be there for your mother. So that, that's and, and for all seniors, because they don't have they don't they will not always have the, the, the capability or the comfortability to be able to get to those 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 uh, voting areas and have that access. So we cannot bring forth a system that is supposed to ensure it, but yet make it unaccessible to seniors. It makes no sense. And the same thing for veterans who are deployed. So we will always have that option for seniors and for veterans and the disabled. We have to think about that as well. So that should remain in place, at least under my administration and on the bill that I will be proposing. So that will never go away. So that, that is my direct answer to you that will be in place. Mail and voting will be in place for those seniors. Those veterans are disabled, so they will always maintain that access. But for all of us who have the ability to show up, to be there and to vote same day, let, let's get it done and make sure that it is again, dependable, accurate, and captures everyone's votes. Right. We'll, we'll see how it rolls out for you, but my very first thought was like, my mama ain't gonna stand in, you oh, know no, what I'm no. saying? I mean, like I said, she, she would. I know, yeah, you know what I'm saying? Like, right like, like no. real deal, for all the right reasons. Mm -hmm. But you know what I mean? It's our, our cherished community elders yes. is the first thing I think about. I'm yeah. like, what? No. So an, another thing here is the, the undemocracy, you know what I'm saying? It's, and uh, as far as the party, party platform, mm -hmm. um, and I'm assuming going out here on a ledge, I'm assuming that you guys are wanting to use terms that are more aligned with a, a, a republic of, of what we are actually, yes. where a lot of people assume that we are a democracy, yes. but we're actually a republic. Thank and you. a lot, most people, I don't know, man, a lot of people don't go to civics class no yes. more. 
Yeah. And so, you know, I mean, I'm kind of giving you the benefit of the doubt. You, you guys oh. might be thinking something different. If no. that's the case, you know, we're going to have to get spicy up Oh, no, here. 100%. But and I would get spicy, well, too. Is, is yeah. Once you explain, because yeah. that's very shocking yes. to see ink on paper, yeah. you know, especially for somebody, people who might not understand. Yeah. Yeah, so America, problem? so our form of government, we, we are a constitutional republic. And, and mm. you, you captured it because, obviously, you know our form of government. We often talk democracy, democracy, which is, it sounds beautiful. I mean, it's, it's something that a lot of people grew up hearing, and it, and it is a beautiful thought. Democracy happens within this constitutional republic. The beauty of a constitutional republic, which is why Dr. King often referred to it, is, is that power is inherent in the people. So a republic says that the people hold the power. And back in my day, someone born without civil rights, you know, my older brothers and sisters back in the day, you know, you'd hear them walk around, power to the people, right? And I'm about bringing that back <laughs> because we've drifted from that. And that's where we started with our conversation. Again, power to the people. This is a constitutional republic and our constitution guarantees under that declaration, the Article 1, Section 1 of the Washington State Constitution, powers inherent in the people, that government derives their just powers from the consent of the governed, which is the people, and that it is government's job to protect and to maintain the individual rights of our citizens, our people. That is what a constitutional republic is. And that Article 1, Section 1 of our Washington State Constitution comes directly from that Declaration of Independence. And so that is speaking to what your question was, to give full clarification this is what a republic, a constitutional republic actually is. And this is why, you know, the root of, of my governance as governor, it's the constitution because it's, it, it serves the people. The constitution is there to protect the people from government, to protect the people. The people is the root and the foundation of our nation. The strength of our nation is its people. This is why your questions, everything you said, talking about going to communities, listening to the people, the people must be our strength. They always have been and they must. The, this is the only reason, really, and that sounds terrible to say, but no, it's not, why I'm so forged and passionate about this election and why I'm here to serve. We have to give it back to the people. We just have to. And for me, that has nothing to do with Republican or Democrat. It has everything to do about America and what we should stand for and what so many died for. Mm. So, I mean, should people be worried? You know, I mean, like, like I said, what, what the outcome of that Republican Party platform. Mm -hmm. And it's good, you see, I wanna give you a chance to explain stuff. No. Because you know, people should like hear from you. You know. As, as did, when, I mean, like I said, for, for me, I, you know, I'm not going to say here if I agree, disagree, whatever, but I understand. Yes. So now I understand because, yeah. you know, like I said, I took civics, Garfield High School. Mm -hmm. Let me put, let me put, the, let me, <laughs> let me put the camera right here. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Also, in the ninth grade, they give you the green book. That's the Washington State history book. That's why, you know what I'm saying, mm -hmm. I might on a dare name off 39 counties for you, <laughs> at least 30 of them, because, you know what I'm saying, I passed Washington State That's history. Right civics and everything else that's right but so it's fine if if that's the point it that is. you're like oh okay because some people i mean it's not even being malicious a lot yeah. of people are just ignorant yeah. about our country the way that it works yes you know what i'm saying and the way even our legislature works and all those kind of things 100%. now keeping it on this though mm -hmm. the other thing that was there was you said going back to the legislature mm -hmm. Selecting the senator mm -hmm. was that in the platform as well. That was one of the things that, that I believe so the, I read in there. So I wasn't there for um, the full part when they went through every single aspect right. of, the, of the platform, so I can't speak to that. Okay, and, I, and you know me, I don't, I won't speak to something if if, if I don't know about it. So no, it's all good. I was just thinking, like y'all pass that, y'all get might get mollywop right now yeah. because and the, yeah. the Democrats got it popping down in the legislature. Yeah, so yeah. They, no. they gonna send it, they send. No, I, I wasn't in there for for, for every okay. single aspect of that because I had a. All right, so it's it's, it's all good right here. Um, we're going to take one more quick break and then we're going to take it back to my neighborhood of the yeah, Central District. We'll let you go, okay? You're watching Off the Clock. 
When I launched Back to Basa last year, what was important to me was that one, we uplifted our stories, not only from Seattle, but all across the region. And two, that this show, Back to Basa, was always free and accessible to everyone everywhere, no matter their situation. That way, they can see what I see daily. You know, the beauty, the excellence, and the resilience of our communities across the Pacific Northwest. Why? Because access to positive images of us is important and necessary, as representation always matters. So look, no matter where you live, be it the Central District or Centralia, Bellevue or Boise, Portland or Pullman, or anywhere across the country, I want you to join me on this Back to Basic journey by downloading the free Fox Local app on your phone or smart TV as we continue to elevate the very best of us in our communities. And then you'll be able to see what I see, and you'll know that our story is amazing and this uplift is always real. All right, welcome back to Off the Clock. I'm about to wrap up right here with that. Want to tell you the 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 ad that you saw right there, the promo right there for our, actually for our show Back to Basa. And the reason why we made sure to put it in here is this is the show is Back to Basa where the Northwest connects. And you probably see there by the promo that she's all over the state. You see Spokane in there. You see Vantage in there. Then even beyond the state, Portland, Boise. Um, and so encourage you to check it out, Back to Basa. You can go to our website, whereweconverge.com forward slash back to Besa. But also you can download the Fox Local app and you can see all 41 episodes. Like I said, I think that people from all across the state of Washington will find a lot of relevancy. We've covered a lot of stories from um, eastern Washington, western Washington, the north, south, everything else. So yeah. and you also you can follow Besa Gordon, the host at Besa, B-E-S-A, Gordon. All right, back to it. <laughs> so taking, taking it back here to my neighborhood, you know, I wanted to, to kind of give space here and this opportunity to, to be as broad as possible to, to all different citizens, constituents, however it is across the state of Washington. And that's why we've talked about issues that might impact over on the east side of the mountains, issues that impact on the west side of the mountains, issues that might impact, you know, um, everybody, mm -hmm. you know, especially things like taxes. Mm -hmm. By the way, listen, there was a guy who ran for an office in New York. I think he ran for mayor or whatever. The name of his party was the rent's too damn high. You ever <laughs> see You ever see guy? He's like, he's like, man, the rent <laughs> is too damn... I'm going to tell you, wh who, whoever is wins this government, uh, this governor's race, I'm representing the people. When yes. I can tell you this, the rent is too damn high. Yes. Every, man, everything is expensive. Yes. It's expensive. And certain people, you know, I mean, some people, they, they have the resources. Certain people, they just know how to yeah. hustle and bustle through it. And other people, they get in their bus whooped. Yeah. right now yes. it's getting whooped in the grocery yeah. store yeah. it's getting whooped at the gas station it's getting whooped on a rent bill i mean and that's real yeah. like we're we're getting whooped over mm -hmm. here man mm -hmm. you know oh, no, uh, i know i said i was taking to a neighborhood when i thought about my neighborhood the first thing i thought about is like damn we getting whooped yeah. on so no it's not just your neighborhood it's it's neighborhoods all over the state i mean mm -hmm. it really is it's it, we talk about this and we talk about the taxes and we talk about the fees and and, and we talk about upstream, downstream, you know, when, when you raise prices or cost of doing business, then the businesses have to raise the cost of goods sold and they have to raise the cost of services because they have to pay their leases and their equipment. And, and they, I mean, everything goes up. There, there, there's a, a correlation and, and a cause and effect to everything. We have to stop and think about a housing. We, we are short housing units in Washington state, but yet we over-regulate builders and we're not, doing that the right way. There are so many things we can do. And so I want people to understand, we need to stop and think about, do we want more, again, career politicians or do we want someone who actually understands how to run a business? Someone who understands how to read a ledger, someone who understands micro and macroeconomics, who actually understands certain aspects of running organizations. That's what we need is someone who's willing to go to work, not just to get elected to hold an office for a certain political party, I don't do anybody's bidding because they've already tried to buy this. And I said, no. So I'm here to serve the people, all of the people. And that's the difference that we're making. Yeah, I will say that like, 
maybe not necessarily in this race, but just in general, and maybe in this race too. Mm -hmm. But like a lot of times, a lot of what we see in different councils and leadership, and sometimes in city councils and county councils and things like that, and it should be a lot of diversity of, of life journey. Mm -hmm. it's, but we find a lack of business people, small business people. Like for us, in my neighborhood, black women are the elitist so nationally, entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. black, man, black, black women entrepreneurs exploding everywhere. You see mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. Like all throughout in, in our community, you know what I'm saying, where, where these small businesses now are starting as a pop-up. Mm -hmm. Nora Lux Candle, a perfect example. Carlina Bruce, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying, started during COVID. Now mm -hmm. it's brick and mortar there in, um, in Belltown mm -hmm. and all kinds of other stuff around mm -hmm. the state. We see these small businesses emerge in our community and probably communities across across the state and a lot of times the people who make the policies the rules and the regulations they ain't never sat up like me i sit up on thursday night because mm -hmm. i know payrolls on friday yes and if you ain't sat up with your stomach <laughs> twisted and you're trying to figure it out and you know around 3 4 a.m that wells fargo's coming through with, with that squip to pull everything out that account and you go like man i gotta pay people when, when you go in, it's mm -hmm. like, man, how can we afford this? Do that, man. Those things put you, yes. build an empathy amongst other yes. business owners and, and people who are in business. And it doesn't matter if you're a Republican yes. or a Democrat because the labors of being a business owner yes. itself puts you in a whole nother category of understanding and a whole nother category of like I said, when, when these taxes are due or bills are due or regulation or over-regulation, in some places under-regulation, mm -hmm. some things need to be safer and things need yes. to be whatever. But I guess the, the point that I'm getting at is that for, for my community and for the state as a whole, people who understand the challenges of small businesses yes. and the challenges that small businesses are facing, for me, that's important. I haven't talked about too many things important because I got a long list. Mm. But, you know, since we bring up business and I can think of all these amazing entrepreneurs in my community that I interact with all the time, mm -hmm. you know, and the barriers that they face. Yes. Let's talk about that, man. Small business. You know what I'm saying? Oh, you yeah. got any thoughts on this? Oh, no, 100 percent. I've been a small business owner and I started with nothing. I started with an idea and then I asked my wife permission. <laughs> you know, it's kind of how, how it went down. But I mean, I've, I've thrived and I've struggled. You know, I, I mean, I've been there. I, 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 it's, it's, that's the difference between entrepreneurs uh, and, and, and many others. Entrepreneurs put it all on the line and they feel that and they feel the stress um, and they feel the angst and they're the ones who stay there. You know, I remember sweeping out bathrooms, cleaning out bathrooms myself because I couldn't afford a janitor. So I'm washing out toilets because that's what we do. We do whatever we need to do to keep the lights on to make sure we make payroll when they, when they shut down the state. I mean. I was I had to keep payroll going and PPP didn't do as much for me as as others would have thought it would have and and so but I kept doing what I could do um, to make sure people had a check because they had families and so I guess what I would say is understanding that just like you said that is the difference but knowing how to do it we should be opening up more avenues we should start earlier we should start educating people on the pathway to small business ownership we should start looking for ways to bring, and I already know how we do it, but to, to, to lessen those employment payroll taxes, to ease up on those, those, those L and I fees that you pay for different personnel, all those things that you would not know if you did not own a business because you pay for a business license or a state license, and then you pay for a license for the city that you do business in. And so now you're double dipping, meaning you're being charged twice just to have a business. And people would know that. If you own a bar, you're paying liquor taxes, the highest mm. in the nation. You know, I mean, people don't know this unless you know this. So let's start looking for elected officials who actually know it, who felt it, who, who understand it. Yeah, I think that right now in the, the temperature, the temperature in a lot of neighborhoods has always been there. And it's going to be interesting. I'll be honest with you. It's going to be interesting in, in this election for governor um, because... I think in certain areas and in certain neighborhoods, the there's a lot of people who aren't just ready to go with the status quo. Yeah. And I'm not ready. I'm not sitting here endorsing you at all because yeah. you're the outsider. Yeah. 
But what I am saying is that there's a lot of people, man, you're just sick and tired of being sick and tired. Yeah. And being sick and tired of being priced out. I mean, it's like, it's like you know, transportation here is an issue because it's very expensive yeah. now. There's a lot of fees, lots of everything else. The thing that I'm bringing up is that there's an opportunity in this, in this state, in this election. And whether that opportunity is, is yours, whether it's um, uh, A.G. Ferguson, whether it's Riker, Mullet, wh whoever's running mm -hmm. out there, is that people would be foolish to think, to paint with a broad brush, for example, to be like, oh, all the black folks, they feel this way, so mm -hmm. it's going to be whatever, mm -hmm. all the whatever. Man, there is a lot, and it's not like crazy discontent, like, you know, burn it down or something, yeah. but there's a lot of discontent where people are open for new ideas because certain things have not moved forward in their life. I'm not saying that Simi Bird is the answer or Ferguson's the answer or anybody else who's running is the answer. But what I do know as someone who every day has his finger on the pulse is that there are a lot of people who do not, absolutely do not fit into the traditional R or D anymore. And the people who aren't just going to back in the, I, my mama said back in the day, you could press one lever and it would, it yeah. would hit your whole slate or whatever yeah. it's called. There's a lot of people who, who are not feeling that way. And I mm -hmm. think that whatever candidate actually taps in to what ground level people in the state of Washington are feeling, mm -hmm. to what everyday people is feeling. It's like we see it all the time. People be writing off demographics. They write them off. Sometimes oh, yeah. these elections, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Sometimes they come down yeah. to these blocks or these groups yeah. of people who was ignored. That's right. That's right. And I'm not ignoring, ignoring anyone. And, and let's not forget our zillennials, our youth, right? Our youth are a power force and they are starting to see that they can't afford a house based on what they're seeing. Like we said earlier, they can't afford to, to maintain um, domicile without partnering with like four other young people trying, trying to go to school, trying to go to night school, trying to hold down a job. They see the cost of living in, in Seattle and Puget Sound area. It's out of control. They, they see it. And so when you're seeing it and you're feeling it, they're going to start voting how they're feeling and they I'm, our youth are some smart passionate individuals and they're the future of determining what's going to happen for the state as well as every other demographic but you, your point is solid people are ready for something different i'm feeling it and that's well, what you saw in spokane so so i do i do have a question yeah. so you, especially since you bring up our younger people mm -hmm. so i think lorkin represents that demographic you know. <laughs> is, I mean, you, you've also got a lot of people who are just now turned off, yeah. even young people. Mm -hmm. And I mean, for somebody like you, specifically to your candidacy, mm -hmm. for you to fill these gaps. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I heard in the previous interview that you said that you have a different playbook that Culp didn't have mm -hmm. because you've got the G GOP resources mm -hmm. all the way down to, to access to funds, to postage discounts, all the way down to, you know, to the PCO levels mm -hmm. and everything else. You have the machine, so to speak, mm -hmm. however big, small the machine might mm -hmm. be. But even with that, yeah. you got to get either a lot of new voters, you got to get people energized, you got to do something, mm -hmm. you know, and keeping it specifically on young people here. What is your plan, especially for young people who are like, Pfft. no, no, it's 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 going to them. And that's one reason why we started our podcast, <laughs> because young people, they use digital, which goes back to our other question. But young people use digital. It's going to them. It's not waiting for them to come to us. That's an old school way of thinking. And it's not just young people. It's all demographics. It's not waiting for them. It's going to them. And that's the difference in our candidacy. I, again, I knew that. I knew what I wanted. I wanted a holistic campaign that people rallied behind us because they believed in the message. And regardless of R or D or I, whatever label you put on it, it's about the message and what you stand for, what you believe in and what you're gonna do for us. It's that whole Janet Jackson, what have you done for me lately? Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna add on to it, what are you gonna do for me in the future? That's mm -hmm. what people wanna know. And if you're not going to them and telling them what you're about, so then they can see who you are about, then it's not gonna work. You're not gonna bring people up and get them excited about voting for anything if you're not getting them excited about something. And that's what we've been doing. So that, that is the key strategy. I mean, I can get into the, like you said, and all the mechanisms and functions that we can bring forward. I'm a strategist, but what I'm saying just to keep it real is keep it real. Go to people and be who you are and let them know why you are the person that will bring that transformational change to Washington. All right. 
So we're almost there. Something that I wanted to bring up with you, right? This is something that I, I want to personally address okay. in this, this conversation right here. Is that, you know, for Seattle, we get picked on a lot, man. You know what I'm saying? And um, from, from our neighbors right across Lake Washington to our neighbors on the other side of the Cascades. Mm -hmm. Now, if you was on Fox, mm -hmm. you said that we used to be the Emerald City. Mm -hmm. Now we're a chunk of coal. Mm -hmm. I take offense to that. Now, you know we're gentlemen, so I don't take like oh, yeah. offense, yeah. but I take offense to that and to say that the city of Seattle is 88 square miles. Yeah. And in this 88 square miles, man, we have some problem areas. This studio right here, you mm -hmm. see this beautiful building we're oh, in, yeah. but we're right here in Pioneer yeah. Square. We're right here on First Avenue. Yeah. You know, we have a beautiful city here mm -hmm. that sits upon all these hills and places and everything else. And when y'all get on national TV and you say that our city looks like a chunk of coal, man, I'm just letting you know that it's impactful. Yeah. And it's also impactful for people who might potentially vote for you who, who might sit there and see that and be like, ah, oh, man, cuz was cool, but you know what? It don't even seem like he rocks with us. He's, no. he's talking, you yeah. see what I'm saying? No, I, so I do, and let me just say what I was saying when I said what I said, yeah. because I'm from the city. Yeah. I was raised That's in the city. Said. And so when, when you're from the city and you saw what that, you said it yourself, will you see what that city looked like? Look, our city, this city has changed. I ain't got no rose colored glasses on. Yeah. So let's be clear. Yeah. See, here's the problem with yeah. this state. Yeah. And here's the problem with communication. Mm -hmm. Either you got the people who are saying, hey, man, nothing's wrong. It's uh -huh. all good. Or you got the people who's like, oh, Seattle's dying. It's burning down. It's, oh. Oh, it's a cesspool. It's whatever. And then you got the people like me and Alia and, and, and Susan and Lorcan who be in this city every day. And yeah. we loving and we thriving. We sad. We cry or whatever. But mm -hmm. this is our city. Yeah. And so the people who live here actually will tell you like, oh, man, I don't know. Right over there, it's pretty greasy. Right over here, it's beautiful. Yeah. But so when people give us one side of something and not really being sincere about the totality of our city. Yeah, so that, that's saying? the context of what I was saying. Uh -huh. it, it, was, it was a compare and contrast to say, Seattle used to be this and mm -hmm. now it's this. And the point of saying that, which I did say, is that it can be back to where it was again. Mm -hmm. That's right, we talked I'm, about I'm that. I'm just trying to make sure, and if you are, this is a good place for you to say it. Yeah. I'm just trying to make sure that you're, you're not one of these people who are sitting here talking about it's all just doom and gloom in Seattle oh. and it's burning down and it's where, I'm like, you know, I mean, it's probably not a wise yeah. approach for a politician. Yeah. You know, you, need, you might need to pull yeah. out a few votes out no. the Emerald City. Yeah, I, I, I don't pander, you know, okay. I, and I say, what, I say what's on my mind. I, spe mm -hmm. I speak truth. Um, that's just how I am. But I meant that. And the way I meant that is simply this. I grew up in the most beautiful. We used to bring our kids down to go mm -hmm. downtown. It, it, again, I don't, I'll put words in my mouth from my mouth. Mm -hmm. This is the city I was raised in. We could, as a, as a teenager, I could ride my bike and my mom would come down and pick my best friend up and then drive no. us home again. It was I, so I, I get you. And I'm yeah. not even trying to join. I, I just wanted to clarify because okay. there is... There is a uh, a sentiment out there that everything about Seattle is oh, horrible. No. Everything is everything is burning down. Everything no. is a cesspool. Everything is whatever. And so I just wanted to give you an mm. opportunity to be yeah. able to be like, if what you're saying is is that the Seattle can go back to the Seattle that you saw before, Ooh. that not the Seattle is this. You know what? It, it's I like, love it's, my city, man. Oh, I love it. You know what? It's, it's, come it's, on it's, now. It's, oh, come on now. It, it's like it's like finding something <laughs> at a. At, at one of those cells or whatever, and you're like, mm -hmm. what, what is this? And it's, oh, it's worth $10 billion. I was like, what? Seattle is, is, is precious. Mm. It's beautiful, always has been. We are a cultural mecca. I mean, look at where we, we're, we're a port city. <laughs> look at our landscape. I mean, it's where we're at ge geographically, in terms of the culture, the people, everything. This is my city. This is my home. It, not where I was born, but where I was raised. That's where my heart is. This is my city. That's why I said that. That's why I say this. This is where my heart is. Oh no, I, I oh, I'm, I'm here. Right. It, that's where you have that skin in the game. You get passionate about what was and what must come back again because you know the beauty from within. You don't give up on it because we could leave. We could have left. I did not abandon. I did not give up. I'm fighting 
to bring it back to the beauty and we make see, it even better. We see you in the streets last summer. You oh, know yeah. what I'm saying? So, you know, I'm balancing that in my head. Like, when I was watching that, I was like, well, man, I you mean. You know where I came back. You know where I came back to. That's right. So, a second here, we're going we're gonna to let you tell the good, the good uh, citizens of the state of Washington, you know what I'm saying, why, why they should vote for you. Um, if, um, but, you know, one, I wanted to say thank you. Um, you know what I'm saying? This is, you're, you know what I'm saying? You're looking, you're, you're making records already. You say you was the first black endorsed <laughs> gubernatorial, this and that. Mm -hmm. You're also the first candidate to, to, to come here through the studio. Um, won't, won't be the last. Yeah. And also put a call out for, for all the other candidates for, um, that are running for governor. You know what I'm saying? More than welcome here in the Black Media Matter studio. You, you can see that, uh, that Mr. Bird here, you know, you, Coming in and out one piece. I will. I will say this though, right? Is that? See, this is early, mm -hmm. right? On the clock, the election clock, and everything else. So then we just have our conversation. If you win the prize, and you see, we got the nice, comfy chair. Uh -huh. This, these are Trey on a holiday's uh -huh. chairs, by the way. We got the nice, comfy ones. Uh -huh. You win the primaries, though. We bringing out them uncomfortable stools. You see what I'm saying? I'll take that challenge. <laughs> we we go we go bring out them stools, <laughs> oh, I'll take and then that and then we then we go go and dig deep no. and everything else. <laughs> but this is this is really an opportunity for people in our community who have been seeing you mm -hmm. and your name recognition yeah. for almost a year for people in our neighborhood to learn more about you. Mm -hmm. And it turns out this will also be an opportunity for uh, a lot of people who follow you across the state, but mm -hmm. also in Eastern Washington mm -hmm. to learn more about our platform and our issues that are over here. So, I mean, it's been almost two hours. Yeah. It went fast though. Oh no, it was good. And it's great. I'm looking forward to coming back. Um, this is what it's all about is keeping it real and, and being available, being present for those again, who you want to serve. And I'm honored and I thank you for bringing me in. All right, we'll awesome. keep, we're gonna keep an eye on your campaign. Yeah. You know what I'm saying, all that good stuff. So, Simi Bird, why don't you go ahead and look into this camera right here. I'll let you address <laughs> the good people of the state of Washington. Well, I would say this, my friends. It, it's, it's simply, there is an opportunity, as Omari said. It's an opportunity for all of you to make a decision as to which direction you want our state to go in. Um, I want you to make a decision for the people. This is what our campaign is all about. It's getting back to our constitution, that everyone has value, everyone has worth, and we will never discount or cast aside anyone ever again, not in this nation and not in our state. My home, Seattle, my home, and Washington, my home. It's up to us, we the people, to come together, to unite around one candidate that will represent all of us, regardless of race, creed, color, or religion, this is our beautiful nation. This is our beautiful state. I hope I can earn your vote. I hope I can earn your support. And we may not agree on everything, but we can agree on this will be something different, this primary and this general. And I hope that you can see in me my passion and love for this beautiful state and my value for all of you. And thank you all. Thank you, brother. All right, Simi Bird. <laughs> <I'm a man. laughs> thank you, brother. Uh, and GOP endorsed candidate for governor of the state of Washington. Yeah, birdforgovernor.com. Birdforgovernor.com. Check us out. And so, so listen, I'm not big on slogans, but apparently the slogan <laughs> is they want to give Olympia the bird. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> you see all your uh, 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 I love uh, it. I love it. <laughs> all right, man. We'll see you out on the trail. Oh, brother, thank you, man. Okay. <laughs> all right, everybody. Thank you for, for tuning in for, for this episode. Man, we've dusted it off the shelves. All year. It's been two years since we've done an episode off the cloud. Did I do okay? Okay. This is awesome. I, you did great. We're still, still in one piece here. Oh, and like I said, you know, our, the, the doors of the Black Media Matter studio is open. People are running out there for, for governor, you're running for a statewide office. People in our neighborhood, our neighborhood of the Central District and mm -hmm. South Minnesota, Seattle and, um, you know, South King County and things like that. Um, man, they deserve to hear from you. And also in coming on this platform, I can guarantee you that more than our neighborhood is going to hear from you. Yeah. But this is, you know, we stay rooted in our roots um, and our roots is in our neighborhood. And if you feel that our people are important right. to hear your message, 
You're very welcome here. That being said, big thanks to our director, Alia D'Alessandro, to our photographer, Susan Freed, to our writer, Lorcan Stokes. Until next time, peace.